بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم تسليبا كثيرا كثيرا فما بعد ما brothers and sisters in the in our living Islam class this is uh, the we continue with this, uh, the series on uh, marriage I think this is the third one um, and today I'm going to talk to you and maybe today and maybe the next one also on making the marriage meaning who should get married uh, what must we look for in the spouse I think these are very important questions um, at least among the young men I don't like to use the word boys because if you are a boy then you are not ready to get married if you are a girl you are not ready to get married you are ready to get married if you are a young man or a young woman and that is why it's important for you to first decide whether you are fit to be married or not are you capable <coughs> of being married of getting married and of remaining in the marriage please understand it's not just the physical thing it is to enter into a relationship which illa mashallah is a lifelong relationship and which can be as i mentioned before it can be a living jannah or a living jahannam for you and whether it is a living jannah or a living jahannam for you is entirely and completely and totally in your hands it will be whatever you want to make it and that is the reason why it is very important to go in there with your eyes wide open now many of the young men who talk to me today it's almost standard uh, they tell me chef please make dua that i should get married right so there seems to be one single uh, thought in their mind that they want to get married alhamdulillah nothing wrong with that what is halal is halal alhamdulillah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you beautiful spouses who will be the uh, cause of great happiness and tranquility and peace and harmony in your homes. The question is this, the question is how do you decide, I told you, decide if you are ready to get married. Now how do you decide that? There is the best criterion, the best advice is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, told us and he said to the young man he said if you are ready to get married then get married because this is good for you um, instead of you know looking here and there get married and he said if you are not ready to get married or if you are unable to get married then he said fast because fasting reduces the uh, urge the physical urges so when he, they asked him, well, what is the meaning of being ready to get married? He said, when you are ready and capable of supporting a spouse. Now, this is something that people forget. And uh, I get questions from uh, uh, young men who are in, uh, in college or just finishing high school or something, um, who are, you know, dying to get married and say, oh, uh, I, I want to get married. I say, okay, so how are you going to support your wife? Do you earn? No, I don't earn. Uh, so you want your father to support your wife, right? That's amazing. I mean, you, you want to marry this girl and you, have, you want your father to pay for that. Isn't that, isn't that strange? Isn't that the, the most peculiar thing that you can think about? I can say many funny things about it, but I'm not going to. I'm going to leave you to think about your own funny things. But please understand this. Support means you. You are marrying her. She is your responsibility. She is not somebody else's responsibility. So therefore, unless and until you are earning enough to be able to support your wife comfortably, you are not ready to get married. Number one. Number two, let me give you some very uh, personal and straightforward advice. And that is that if you are ambitious, if you want a career, if you want to do something, you know, uh, adventurous in life, if you want to do something substantial in life, 
then if you get married it's going to put a stop to that and for good reason there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that because if you think that getting married means you can get married and then you can abandon your wife uh, in your home and you take off uh, you know for long periods of time uh, in this or that activity no sorry that that means you are being um, you are being uh, you are violating her right that she should be looked after that you she needs your company that physically you need to be there uh, and if you do that you are violating her right so that's not marriage so if you are if you get married and if you want to be a responsible husband and you really have no choice because there is no choice in islam of being an irresponsible husband so if you want to be a responsible husband and remember in last week's uh, lecture we talked about how when you get married you are making allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu the witness for this marriage right and you seek your rights through allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so therefore you are accountable to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if you get married then obviously that marriage must get your full and complete and first attention everyone else and everything else and all other relationships come thereafter so now what happens to your ambition what happens to the if you want to start a business for example you have to spend long hours you have to work you have to work i mean when i started my consulting practice i used to uh, many times i used to be on the road almost 23 24 days in a month my wife was alone at home now by then i had been married for uh, almost 10 years but this is what happens so i am telling you i am not presenting myself to you as a perfect example i am also sharing with you uh, some mistakes but my point is if i had not done that if i had not had that kind of focus i would not have been able to build my career I did my executive MBA within one month of having been married. So after one month of marriage, my wife went off to her parents' place, and I went to the IIM Ahmedabad, the Indian Institute of Marriage Management Ahmedabad, and I stayed there. I had no money, so I stayed there the full period of the executive MBA, and I never saw my wife. And these were the days I am talking about 1983 and uh, 1985, uh, where we didn't have uh, social media, we didn't have. Uh, a skype we didn't have whatsapp whatsapp calling or some other calling uh, a phone call was astronomically expensive because my wife was in england was was in the uk so an international call was was absolutely astronomically uh, expensive and there's no way i could do that so i didn't i never talked to her for months one month after getting married now i'm not again putting this to you uh, as a Uh, you know uh, as an example that you should do this i'm just saying to you that if you if you want a career this is the kind of sacrifice within course that you have to make and your wife has to make i was able to do it as i told you i'm not asking you to do that i'm saying i was able to do that but it is not something that everyone can do what usually happens is that you have to put paid to your career to your future aspirational goals because you got married and i have seen cases where later on in life a lot of resentment has built up between the spouses because quite unrealistically and quite unfairly they blame each other for what happened in their lives although they were both responsible so young men and young women if you are career oriented and if you are serious about your career follow that career first and take it to some level where now you can comfortably get married and your spouse can be with you while you pursue your career if there is a stage in your career where you are not able to give time to your spouse stay with the career and you are serious about the career then stay with the career do not get married right fast take cold showers put your bed into the shower sleep there and keep the water on do what you want but do not get married don't ruin your own life and don't ruin the life of somebody else and don't do something and then later on you know wish you hadn't done it that that's a complete and total waste of time so please don't do that so when are you ready to go you are you are ready to get married when you are standing firmly on your own feet not on your father's feet
in the hadith of uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, which is in Bukhari, Rasulullah said, a woman is married for four things. And this is a woman also, in, in this case, you know, uh, the man also is married for, for these things. A woman is married for four things. Her wealth, her family status, her beauty, and her religion. So you should marry the religious woman. Otherwise, you will be a loser. Now, um, the um, the issue here in this hadith is to think about is that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is saying four things. A woman is married for her wealth, her family status, her beauty and her religion. Now, first and foremost, please understand this. This does not mean that you get to swallow your wife's wealth. It does not mean that you marry the wealthy woman because she's going to bring a big dowry. Taking money from the woman, taking money from her family in order to get married, right? Taking a dowry is haram. It is utterly and totally shameful. It means that you have reduced yourself to the level of a bakara, to a billy goat who gets purchased for a reason. Right? Don't put yourself on sale. Don't do that to yourself. It's utterly and totally shameful. Now, I'm sure many of my Arab uh, uh, brothers and sisters will be wondering what I'm talking about, but in the in, in the uh, Indian subcontinent, uh, this is the custom, and we have taken this custom from the Hindus, where uh, when a when a person when a when a man gets married, his wife brings dowry to the house, and you will be surprised. The she has to bring gold, she has to bring money, she has to bring utensils, she has to bring furniture. Uh, they demand uh, flats and apartments, they demand cars, they demand all kinds of uh, things. It's so utterly shameful that Muslims, for us, we have self-respect. When we get married, when Muslims get married, we give presents to the wife, we give presents to her father and mother. We give presents to her family to the extent that we can do that. We give her mahar. The mahar is her personal property. She can do what she wants with it. We don't take anything. So please understand this. Never ever take. Don't take a single handkerchief. Right? If you have any self-respect and if you don't have any self-respect then I, then I ask the the, 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 the girls, the young ladies, think about that. You want to marry a man who has put himself on sale? You want to buy your father to buy the man to, to marry you? What kind of a man is that? So wealth does not mean this. Wealth means only she's coming from this background and so on and so forth. Beauty, of course, no problem. Uh, family status, of course culture, society, now religion. Now that is very, very important for us to think about. So many of my uh, young brothers and sisters who are now getting ready to commit matrimony, uh, my advice is six critical requirements, right? Six critical requirements. The first of them is Islam. Never marry somebody who is not a Muslim. Now, please don't get confused. Many people will say, oh, but you see, we are allowed to marry uh, women of the book. First and foremost, a Muslim woman is not permitted to marry a non-Muslim man, irrespective of whether that non-Muslim man is a Christian or a Jew or, a, or an atheist or a Hindu or a Sikh or whatever. No Muslim woman is permitted to marry a non-Muslim man, period. Now, Muslim men, we know the hadith where Rasulullah permitted Muslim men to marry uh, women of the people of the book, which means Jews and Christians. So, a Muslim man can marry a Christian woman or a Jewish woman. But there again, please understand that. That refers to a Muslim man living in a Muslim society who wants to marry a Jewish or a Christian woman who is living in that society. Meaning that the overall complete influence and in society and atmosphere would be strongly Muslim. So in that case, if 
this person marries this lady, the children will be Muslim, the children will go to a go to the masjid, the children will be given an Islamic education and so on and so forth. Now, if there is a danger because you are living in a country where uh, there is it's not a, there is there's no Muslim uh, society, and if there is a danger that the children might choose some other religion and they might not be Muslims, then this this kind of a, a, a union is not permissible. Number one. Number two, the question I always ask people is this. Why would you want to marry a Jewish or a Christian woman? Because you love her, right? So you fell in love with this beautiful girl and you, and you want to marry her. But you know very well that if she dies without Islam, where she's going and what's going to happen to her. So what kind of love is this? That you want to marry the woman, you want her to live with her all your life and you don't care what happens to her in the Akhirah? So please, marry Muslims. Muslims, marry Muslims. Make this into a rule for yourself. So Islam has to be the number one criterion. So the first and foremost things to think to look about look at is does she and he what I'm saying here applies to both spouses do they follow the religion following the religion begins with not committing shirk not doing shirk so if you've got a husband or a wife who wants to go to the darga who wants to go to a mausoleum or a grave and uh, you know uh, make tawaf of the grave or to uh, make sajda on the grave or to make dua uh, from on the person who is in the grave then this is not somebody that you want to marry please stay far away if you if you if, if your prospective uh, bride or groom uh, is somebody who has all kinds of uh, shady customs in the name of religion uh, in their family stay far away stay far away Please do not fall into this trap of saying, I will marry them and I will change them. You will not change them, they will change you. It's your, not your job. Your marriage, marriage is not a, uh, it's not a reform school, right? It's not a correctional facility. Don't fall into this business of changing anybody. Pick right. Select the right people for the right reasons. Start with a clean slate. So, first question, do they commit any shirk? Number two, do they pray? And by pray, I mean pray regularly, all five prayers on time. If it's the, if it's the man, then hopefully in the masjid. Right? Then fasting. Then zakat. Then Quran. Can they at least read it fluently? It's a shame that grown men and women who are ready to get married cannot even read Quran correctly with the correct Tajweed. I'm not even talking about understanding and so on and so on. I'm just, just plain reading Nazara. Even that they cannot do. This is a very big shame. So don't fall into that trap. Check all these things and ask these questions. Be very sure and clear in your mind that if you end up marrying a husband or a wife who does not pray, who doesn't give charity, does not pay zakat, uh, does not fast, can't even read the Quran properly. I mean, imagine what kind of an atmosphere you're creating for your future generations. So make sure that the religion, I, and I'm talking about the very basic fundamental principles of religion. I'm not talking about, I'm not saying your wife has to be a mufti or something or hafiz Quran, no basic fundamental questions so in terms of religion second thing is character now i told you six things second thing is character what kind of character courage patience sense of honor which is ghira haya confidence presence right uh, manliness in the case of uh, men shyness in the case of women modesty in both cases, composure, a sense of peace and harmony, comfort with silence and not talking incessantly, constantly going chak 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 chak, no. And then dignity, right? And very, very important, 
a good sense of humor. A good sense of humor is critical to survival and critical to a good existence. So good sense of humor. All of these are very critical things in a marriage. Now you might say, how will you remember this whole list? Please read my book. It's called Marriage, Making It and Living It. Check all of these things. How will you check them? You will check them by asking. You will check them by when you meet and talk. Please understand that in Islam, it is permissible for and permissible and it's also highly advisable and it is strongly recommended that you meet personally face to face the person that you want to marry the boy and the girl even the girl who uh, wears niqab to meet her prospective husband she is permitted to take off not just permitted she is required and she is it is highly recommended for her to take off her niqab let him see your face and for you to see his face and obviously he is not wearing he is not wearing a niqab so you will you will see his face but let him see your face there are two cases in which the woman who is a niqabi is allowed and it is recommended and she is uh, she is permitted to take off her niqab one is in this case where it is a prospective husband and wife prospective bride and groom who are talking to each other about getting married to each other in this case remember they are both not married they are not married yet yet they are permitted to take off the niqab they are permitted to speak to each other they are permitted to uh, ask each other any question they want the only caveat is they are not permitted to go into a room secluded by themselves to do that they must do all of this but they must do it in a public place now that doesn't mean they need to be surrounded by people sitting and, and eavesdropping no but public place library uh, restaurant some public place point number three first religion islam second um, character and uh, in character again before i go to point number three very very important look for humility look for good manners believe me good manners are far more important than a good face good manners will last far longer than the prettiest or the most handsome face and good manners will be the reason for the success of your marriage and the tranquility in your home and good marriage are the best legacy that you can give to your good manners is the best legacy that you can give to your children so look for good manners one of the uh, best places to look for good manners is to see how they treat people who are weaker than themselves how do they speak to waiters how do they speak to servants how do they speak to those who uh, cannot do you know much for them right people who are in serving positions how do they address them how do they speak to them uh, if you find aggression there if you find uh, arrogance there don't touch that person don't touch that prospective bride or groom with a barge pole don't go anywhere near a person who is arrogant will be arrogant in the home as well. Then we come to um, appearance. Hijab for women and beards for men. You don't want to marry a man who looks like a woman and you don't want to marry a woman who does not uh, obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, it is, it may be confusing because style is important uh, you don't want to uh, there's nothing enduring about uh, looking like something the cat threw up most men end up looking like their fathers and most women end up looking like their mothers so take a good look at the father or the mother uh, and decide because that is how that is what and who you're going to be looking at every morning so make sure that um, the, uh, the the person is a person of uh, dignity and style and uh, a person who confirms to the uh, the uh, principles of Islam 
my mother used to say, Dadi rehna, jhadi ne rehna. So meaning that your beard is like, you know, wild all over the place. No. Rasulullah told us to keep a beard. He didn't tell us, don't trim it. He didn't tell us, don't, uh, don't, 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 you know, make it look nice. No. Of course you can do all of that. And you should do all of that. Make sure that your beard is, uh, is under control. Right? Not, not, a, not like a jungle. Now, very important, if he or she doesn't care about Allah, if they don't care about what Allah said, they are not going to care about what you say. Also, in a tight spot, if they have taqwa, it is that which will come to their aid and which will, which will help them to resolve the situation. The taqwa is what is the thing which will give them strength, it is the thing which will give them sustenance. Right? So it's very important that you marry a person who is a muttaqi. I am not talking about an alim, I am talking about taqwa. It is, if it is not there, if the taqwa is not there to begin with, then there is a major problem. Finally, in a conflict, it is the Quran and Hadith that is your final refuge. If they don't consider that to be important, then you will be up the creek without a paddle. The beauty will wear out in a few months, at least you will stop noticing it. You shouldn't, but you will. And their wealth is not yours anyway. The person will be the one who will assist you in bringing up your children. And those children will be the source of your Jannah or Jannah. They are your Sadaqat al They are your legacy. So if you have someone who is not committed to his or her deen, then you are sunk, no matter how cute they look. So run away fast. This is critical. Stop, re stop listening right now, because if it is not there, the rest of it doesn't matter. Right? So please think about that. These are very, very important things. Then we come our issue of, we we'll look at the issue of falling in love. Now, I always say falling is never a good thing. If you fall down, you get, you get hurt, right? Love, as we know it from our romantic notions, is simply another word for lust or physical attraction. It lasts usually for two weeks. Since you want your marriage to last, last a bit longer than that, it's a good idea to focus on respect which will grow into love. Not falling into love, but growing into love. That lasts and that is forever, so to speak. Because the more you respect, the more you uh, will love that person. What does that mean, growing in love? It means that 25 years after you've been married, every time you look at your spouse, you fall in love all over again. Growing in love means evolving a common language of looks, of signals and words that only the two of you understand. It's almost magical to see it work. I wish it for all of those who are listening to this. That is heaven on earth. So it is respect, honor and dignity that result in love. This love is where your spouse will stand up for you and defend you. Where your spouse will never laugh at you in public. Where your st spouse will not treat you like a, a joke on two legs. Be where, this is where your spouse will be considerate of your faults and hide them and be focused on the many good things yeah, that you bring to the marriage. Believe me, nobody is perfect. You came to the marriage with your faults and she or he came to the marriage with their faults. If you want to look at the faults, they are there. You didn't imagine them. They are there. They were there at the time you got married, even if you didn't see them. And they will be there. And many will be there forever. Nothing that you do is going to change that. But at the same time, if you want to look at the strengths they brought, the beauty they brought, the good things they brought, those also are there. Right? Those also are there. And therefore, focus on that. Forget about the weaknesses. Anytime you see a weakness in your spouse, look at yourself, you have the same weakness. Live with it. Live with it. Treat that as something for you to gain hasanat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forgive them and ask Allah to forgive you for that sake. Make forgiving your spouse a means of you earning jannah. If you want to find fault, you can do that, believe me. Just as they can find fault in you. You are not perfect, they are not perfect. So don't, go, don't get into that. 
focus on what is good and inshallah you will find also plenty of that now this love means that he or she will not complain about the difficulties that may happen along the way but will work with you to overcome them and then they will stand in the night and they will cry before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask for his intervention to help you to succeed this is a person who will never leave your side as long as you live and will pray for your forgiveness when you are gone in my experience this is the only person who you can rely on to do that for all others will forget after a while including your children you will be very lucky you will be, you will be very lucky if you have children who will make dua for you every day in tahajjud after you die those parents who have those kind of children are the luckiest the most fortunate parents in the world but for most people that doesn't happen and if you don't believe me ask yourself did you pray for your parents in tahajjud today now if you didn't do that why do you imagine that your children will do it for you right so maybe this is also a wake up call for you wake up for tahajjud pray tahajjud and pray for your parents pray for your grandparents then manners if their religion is good then watch how they treat their servants their parents other siblings watch how they speak to waiters in restaurants drivers and other service people do they show kindness and concern for others do they have compassion do they show respect for others table manners are very important as well do they say thank you or jazakallah or sorry do they smile often or do they look like you have to take them to a dentist to see their teeth do they laugh what kind of jokes do they like all of these are very important now i know what you're thinking if the religion is good then their akhlaq must automatically be good right wrong because you know as well as i do that today this cannot be taken for granted manners are critical because the day after your honeymoon you are going to be at the receiving end of them so you better make sure you like what you are about to receive kindness concern compassion and a sense of humor are worth their weight in gold that is what will make your marriage and your home a heaven on earth and that is what if it is not there it will make your marriage a hell in on earth a living hell you don't want that then we look at conversation conversation is the soul of marriage it is the life blood of a marriage what is it talk about remember the airheads are not only blonde airheads are of all types all genders and with or without blonde hair and without with or without any hair and they will drive you insane unless of course you are one of them then all power to you two airheads fly listen to them more than you talk because you are doing the assessment i'm talking about sitting and talking to your prospective spouse of course if both of you have listened to this lecture that you are going to be in for a lot of silence <laughs> now when you're looking at when you're talking in conversation look for a breadth of knowledge look for depth of perception look at look for structured thinking look for overall understanding of situations look for lo look for a logical approach look to ask and, and see what do they read very very important what do they read what do they watch on television if they watch television at all what is the addiction uh, level to social media i know cases where marriages have actually broken up because the husband or the wife couldn't take their face out of facebook the actual marriage they, they went to divorce because of this you don't want that to happen to you please understand that so ask for authors books topics don't make it into an interrogation but you know in the course of conversation uh, share your own because that's the best way of asking you say you know have, have you read this have you read jrl tolkien uh, lord of the rings i i read that when i was in school i read that much later uh, when i was an adult trying to understand global politics because that's one of the best books to understand global politics so think about that and and ask them and then see if they are more critical than forgiving what is the trend of the conversation there are some people who are constantly criticizing constantly critical 
uh, ungrateful in their when they speak. They, there's no gratitude in in their uh, in their speech. If that's the kind of person, run away, run like hell, right? Uh, are they more critical uh, than forgiving? Do they look for faults more than excuses for those faults? Which one is that? Uh, do they talk more about problems or more about solutions? Do they talk about more? Do they talk more about material stuff or about the akhirah? When they talk about religion, are they more critical of others or more focused on their own conduct, shortcomings, and need for change? There are people constantly, Sheikh, you know what is happening in this world? You know what they, where the ummah is going? And blah blah blah. Oh, you know how much of shit they do? You know what? You know? No, please. People who are critical about others will be critical of you. I'm not saying you are above criticism, but you can, there's only that much of criticism that you can live with. After that, it will poison your relationship. So be very clear. Then see, um, do they sound like they are dogmatic and bigoted and overly sold on this or that jamaat and critical of all others? That's very important. Sectarianism is a uh, is, is a cancer. You don't want somebody like that. You want people who are inclusive. You want people with big hearts. In other words, look to see if they are more focused towards commonalities with others or differences. Are they more toward dividing people or bringing people together? Please understand, conversation is the lifeblood of a marriage. Without it, you have nothing. Most couples stop talking to one another in less than six months into the marriage. Make sure that you are not one of them. And that for you, uh, and for, but for that, you need somebody who can talk, who has interest to share, who respects you and who respects them, and who are interested in you and who you are interested in, and who are interested in learning from you and you are interested in learning from them. Without conversation, your marriage is going nowhere. I think with this, we'll uh, close today. And inshallah, we'll come back and uh, look at um, going forward. Uh, we we'll look at what more uh, we need to do uh, for our session on uh, marriage. And uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with you and to help you uh, in choosing the right spouse and in living uh, with that right spouse beautifully inshallah wa sallallahu ala nabiyil kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh